All right, welcome back to Your World on NTV Kenya this morning. We continue our discussion on engineering and, and engineers in Kenya and their contribution, of course, to the economy uh, across um, ahead of the World Engineering Day celebrations on March 4th the next week. We want to focus on something else right now, which is the engineering regulatory framework uh, in Kenya. And I have um, a couple of guests with me. I have on Zoom, I have Mrs. Nancy Karigidu, the Principal Secretary of the State Department of Maritime and Shipping Affairs. Welcome to the show. I also have on Zoom Mr. Engineer Nicholas Mosuni, the Registrar or CEO of the Engineers Board of Kenya. And joining me in studio is Grace Onyango, the Director of Capacity Building and Accreditation at the Engineers Board of Kenya. And the other, on the other side of the studio, we also have Engineer Anthony Okere, Director of Compliance and Enforcement at EBK. Wow. I'm in the presence of so many engineers. I hope I can be <laughs> given one after. So, um, but remember, we have a, a question of the day for this discussion. We'll be asking you, do you know how you can identify a qualified uh, professional uh, engineer in Kenya? Again, I'll take the question again. Do you know how to identify a professional engineer in Kenya? We urge you to send us your feedback during the discussion on social media at NTV Kenya at Victor Kiprop underscore on Twitter. Use the hashtag new normal. You can also follow the discussion on Facebook and on Instagram. All right. Um, if we have uh, Nicholas on the, with us, let me just start with you, Nicholas. I think growing up, all of us actually wanted to be, or most of us wanted to be engineers at at one point uh, in time. But anyway, for those who made it, the few who made it, just talk to us about um, engineers in Kenya, uh, touch us on the engineering board of uh, in Kenya, and also the upcoming World Engineering Day. Uh, thank you, Kiprop, and uh, thank you for having us and giving us this opportunity to talk about engineering in Kenya. Um, I'll start by introducing Engineers Board of Kenya uh, before I talk about my experiences. Um, Engineers Board of Kenya is a statutory body. It's uh, created by the Engineers Act of 2011, uh, primarily to regulate the engineering profession to oversee its development, to set standards of uh, engineering practice, and uh, to oversee capacity building in the engineering practice. Um, the act came in 2011, but uh, we have had regulation of the practice since 1969. The only difference with the 1969 act was that the new act uh, broadened the mandate of the board beyond registration. What we had previously was engineers registration act. And so that mandate was a bit limiting. Uh, it dealt so much with the registration of the engineer, the person, but it didn't go beyond that to deal with uh, definition of the standards of the practice, to see how the practice was being um, deployed in practice, as well as also a very critical component to oversee the development of the practice. And so with the new mandate then, uh, the board has the capacity and has the framework within which it can uh, put in place programs, initiatives that also beyond regulating the practice, also try to develop it and uh, ensure that uh, those who wish to be engineers and those who are also engineers uh, carry on um, uh, practicing properly as well as also um, uh, uplifting the standards of the practice in Kenya. And engineering is all over the place. I mean, whenever you wake up, the first thing that you do, you turn off your lights. Uh, Probably you go to the shower, um, use engineering systems to have the water pour on you, so to speak. And so everyone uh, interacts with the engineering directly or indirectly. In all what you do, you'll find that we um, utilize uh, engineering products or engineering services. And so the reason why engineering is regulated is that recognition of its impact uh, to the people's safety, to your health, and to ensure that uh, whatever we do, we do within uh, best practices, we do within uh, systems that can withstand uh, various dynamics and that can also be properly um, uh, um, determined before uh, disaster strikes, for instance. Um, generally, a quick definition of engineering normally is uh, um, the utilization of scientific 
principles to uh, leverage on the resources of nature in the most economical, uh, technically feasible, and sustainable manner. Okay. Uh, so that whatever we do, we must uh, ensure that it can stand uh, future challenges. All right. Um, uh, so uh, by way of introduction, uh, this is who we are, uh, a state uh, regulator, right. uh, as well also as an entity that is supposed to oversee or promote the practice of engineering for the good of the public. Thank you. I asked you about the World Engineer, Engineers Day coming up next week. What does this mean for engineers in Kenya? Oh, thank you uh, for that. I, I, I missed uh, that part. But um, World Engineering Day is a day that was set aside by UNESCO, uh, the United Nations Education, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, um, in collaboration with the World Federation of Engineering uh, Organization, WFEO, to promote the practice of engineering and also to demonstrate uh, to the public, the users of professional engineering services, uh, to demonstrate to them what engineering is all about, what benefits engineering bring to, uh, brings to the nations, and what uh, we can do together um, uh, as a society to appreciate and promote uh, the practice of engineering. Uh, so this will be celebrated on 4th March uh, 2021. A number of activities have been lined up, uh, culminating in uh, a congregation at the University of Nairobi, uh, where we will be um, having engagements uh, towards that objective. Thank you. All right. Let me bring in Grace here. And in our early, in the first hour of this discussion, part of the concern that came through was the under-involvement of mm -hmm. engineers in, in building this country, mm -hmm. issues like the Big Four and, mm -hmm. and, and such that. Mm -hmm. Maybe from where you sit, the, the, um, what could be the reasons why we are not involving um, engineers as much as we should be in our projects? Mm -hmm. And how much of a concern is that to the board? Okay, uh, thank you very much, Victor, for that question. Um, I, I don't think it's much of not, the, uh, not involving engineers, but the involvement of professional engineers as such. So there's a, there's a bit of a difference between um, somebody who is a professional engineer and somebody else because mm -hmm. the certain qualifications that a professional engineer should have, and perhaps we'll get into that. Uh, I do know that, uh, um, like for instance, this expressway, there are engineers involved, and it's one of uh, uh, the greatest projects under the Big Four agenda. Um, the whole idea about the World Engineering Day, as you say, is to bring visibility to the engineer. And I think that is what engineers have lacked for a very long time. They are wonderful projects we are in charge of in this country. Um, if you go to the building sector, the infrastructure sector, the manufacturing sector, the hospitality sector, the health sector, all these sectors, there are engineers involved and they are professional engineers. However, it's the visibility that we have lacked and we are thankful for this uh, World Engineering Day because it, it gives a spotlight to engineers and the capabilities of engineers and what engineers can do. So I think it's more a lack of the visibility, uh, number one, on engineers and what engineers can do and what they have been doing through time and, uh, and also who a professional engineer is in uh, delivery of this specific Actually, projects. let me hold you to that. What's the yes. difference between when you talk about a professional engineer? And, uh, yes. What's the difference between a professional engineer and any other engineer? And any other engineer. Thank Thank you. Um, I'll just want to give a, a small um, uh, history, not really history background, on the categories of engineers that we register at the board. When you go through engineering education and you graduate, you come to the board and we register you in the category of graduate engineer, after which you're supposed to go through uh, some training uh, and practice uh, in the industry so that you can gain the competencies that are required uh, to make you a, a, a professional engineer. Um, like in any other profession, when you're moving from one category to another, there is always uh, the examination of competencies. So that period of training is very important for the graduate engineer because then you get the competencies that allow you to practice independently. At the point when you're transitioning from graduate uh, engineer to professional engineer, we have what we call a professional examination that you sit through. And if you pass that examination, then you become a professional professional engineer and it is at that point we give you a license to uh, uh, to practice okay. uh, independently so okay. that's the major difference and then of course there are other categories about professional engineer but at the point of licensure the entry point of licensure is professional engineer. And, 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 and let me bring in Anthony to this discussion yes. Anthony 
she's spoken about the difference between the, the, a professional engineer and a graduate engineer, but there's also the bit about, I mean, I am Victor Kiprop, I've just graduated as an engineer, and have a new job, then I, I don't have to go to the EBK. Why, why do I need to go to the EBK? Uh, thank you, Kiprop. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank. Thank you for this program, and thank you for uh, National Media Group. I feel at home. I was here uh, several years ago. So, uh, and in, in, here in Nation is when I joined as a graduate engineer. All right. And I left as a professional engineer. Welcome back. So, thank you so much. Um, so, to uh, back to your question, um, the, the reason why the board is there, um, the board, the engineer's board is, uh, as the uh, registrar engineer Msuni uh, said, uh, is established under the Engineers uh, Act of 2011. And as a regulator, uh, we are there. The, the, the most important thing is for the safety and welfare of the public. Uh, to ensure that the welfare, the safety and welfare of the public is guaranteed. Um, if uh, we, we have projects uh, that are being undertaken by professional engineers, and uh, we have other people who want to offer the, the, the uh, services and they are not uh, qualified, then you'll find the standards that are required are not going to be maintained. And that means uh, when we talk about sustainability, we talk about a resilience of infrastructure. This one can only be achieved when we have the right people who have the right competencies to be able to deliver these projects. That is why regulation is extremely important. And as the engineers board, we are not just a regulator, but we are more of a facilitator. We want to make sure that the engineers who are offering services to the public, to, the, to humanity, they are actually um, uh, competent. And as professional engineers, uh, as uh, Engineer Grace mentioned, uh, they take professional responsibility. That means uh, someone who uh, has undergone that program and is a professional engineer or consulting engineer, you are sure that this person uh, is able to deliver. Uh, in fact, we have the uh, engineer's rules that came into effect uh, uh, in 2019. Uh, these engineer's rules uh, provide a uh, code of conduct and ethics. And as an engineer, uh, there are qualities of an engineer. An engineer is, is a person who exhibits uh, integrity. An engineer, uh, there is precision in terms of uh, project implementation. An engineer is a person who, um, you know, even when you're solving a problem, you need to be very, very patient. And all this um, with the future in mind. So uh, as a board, we are there to make sure that on one hand, the welfare and the safety of the public is guaranteed for the sake of uh, the future. All right. And on the other hand, those people who, uh, it gives the framework for only those people who are qualified mm. to be able to practice. All right. All right. And Grace has spoken about the, the, the training that one has to undergo to, uh, from graduate trainee, I mean, graduate engineer to a professional engineer. But sometimes the, the challenge with our country is you go through all these processes, you graduate, you're told, you know, you should pursue a professional course, you should be certified by who, you should join the association. But after doing all this, I still can't find a job. Let me bring in the PS in the State Department of Maritime and Shipping Affairs, Mrs. Nancy Karigedu. Nancy, First of all, the, 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 sec the maritime sector is not so very, very uh, known by many people. Just talk to us about the sector and perhaps the opportunities in this sector for engineers in our country. Uh, thank you very much, Victor. Thank you, NTV. I am very happy to be among engineers, although I'm not one. And our kind of engineering, or what we do, is in a sector called the blue economy. The blue economy basically just means uh, making sustainable use in terms of opportunities, in terms of jobs, in terms of national development, uh, economics uh, from the water bodies that we are blessed with. We're talking the ocean, we're talking of the lakes, the rivers, wetlands, there's a lot of resources. And how to sustainably exploit those resources for economic development, food security, and other issues. That's what concerns us, and that's what we call blue economy. And as you've rightly uh, observed, uh, or one of the speakers has said, engineering is part of our everyday life, not just on land, but also in the water space. And uh, it's now 
the focus of government to really focus on that area. It's been called in other uh, places, the last unexplored frontier. So it's not just in Kenya, but it's also for us and the future economic development of our country rests uh, with the oceans and with our water spaces. It's the reality uh, because they say that uh, we call it planet Earth, but we should have called it planet ocean because 70%, 71% of the world is actually water. We are seven continents that divide five oceans. In terms of Kenya, uh, water space, uh, our water estate, if we measured it and used it, uh, or rather took the size of it, it could form another 31 counties, if we go by what we know. So it's really, really uh, a lot of wealth that we need to focus on, and we've started focusing on. And of course, we need engineers. We call them marine engineers. They come in different uh, um, you know, trainings and specialization. The difference here, uh, engineering on, in, the, in the blue economy, one engineer does many things. On land, we are used to uh, mechanical engineers. We are used to electrical engineers, electronic, mechatronics. But in, in, the, in the blue economy, or when we talk of marine engineers, we're talking of someone who is able to do all those in one because, as you realize, uh, the main training ground or the main focus of the area of employment. You cannot afford to have one engineer for every component. Uh, if we take, for example, the ship, you're talking of one person being able to do, you know, the equipment, to do the, I mean, the machinery on board the ship. We're talking of the same person being able to do the air conditioning, uh, the refrigeration, the electricals, the electronics, the ship building and repair, all of that in one person. So they are very highly trained, very high, highly skilled. And when they are finally released back to land, we're talking of the people then who can drive an industrial revolution like we have seen happen in South Korea. They are retired seafarers then drove the country into uh, the industrial revolution we talk about. I hope I've explained that. All right, uh, let me bring back Nicholas. Uh, I mean, Grace has spoken about the need to, to, to transition from being an engineer, a graduate engineer, to a professional engineer. But sometimes you go um, in the streets and you find employers who actually don't bother to check if I am a professional engineer, if I am certified by the board. What risks do we run? How much of a challenge is this when we have people who perhaps have not met the, 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 the criteria being allowed to, to work so um, freely and undertake uh, key uh, projects. Uh, thank you once again. Um, it is a huge concern and it is a huge risk when one opts to use uncertified professionals either knowingly or unknowingly. Um, the problem is that uh, unlike other things, engineering really speaks for itself and uh, ultimately we find, um, sadly so, um, the results of utilizing uncertified professionals are disastrous. Um, when you talk about uh, collapsed buildings, that is the most uh, uh, visible um, manifestation of uh, this malpractice. Um, there are many other uh, areas where we have challenges uh, um, uh, when we have standards of products that don't meet the thresholds. Uh, and quite often, uh, you'll find that the genesis of this is when um, uh, developers, uh, investors, uh, cut shortcuts, don't want to utilize the right professionals and end up um, uh, in, in, a, in a much bigger problem. Right. So for the board, uh, this has been a problem, uh, but uh, uh, within the current regulatory framework, uh, we are able now to inspect works, visit sites where engineering professional services are, are being offered. And we have now developed a compliance and enforcement directorate ed headed by my colleague, engineer Anthony O'Kerry. Um, what we are also trying to do is to sensitize the public, uh, particularly on the need to appreciate uh, the need to utilize professional services and to show them that 
um, it is not expensive to invest properly because ultimately uh, you are safeguarding, uh, uh, if it is an investor, you are safeguarding your investment from future collapses, for instance, or from future uh, non-performance um, and um, risk reputation. So it, it, it's, it's a collective responsibility, whereas the board, yes, indeed, would put all this. Uh, ultimately, it's a societal uh, uh, mind shift to appreciate that um, the reason we have professionals, one, is to assure you that the persons that are giving you the services are properly trained, are properly skilled, and secondly, you have a recourse, that oh. you have uh, a regulator to whom you can run to uh, and um, ensure that persons who are not giving the right service are debarred. Uh, we also recognize that uh, uh, not all people uh, must be certified by the board, for instance, to undertake particular um, services, uh, but there are uh, specific uh, levels or thresholds that would require um, one to ensure that uh, uh, the services are given by a certified professional, particularly when it comes to approvals, submissions to authorities, where one is committing themselves that the work that they've done meets particular thresholds. Right. Uh, but we may not be able to do that as a board at the level, say, of an artisan, uh, where they are actually supervised by the engineer. The engineer takes the full responsibility. In case of something going haywire, you have a recourse, can, can come to the board with a very robust framework. Engineers rules have been mentioned, uh, clear disciplinary procedures and mechanisms on the professional, and uh, we can be more accountable to the public. Well, Thank just you. just before we take a break, let me bring in Anthony briefly. Anthony, um, Nicholas has mentioned about the framework and the compliance uh, structure that we have, but then he, uh, on his last uh, sentence, he mentioned about that not all of them actually have to be then licensed or regulated by the board. Don't you think that opens then a very dangerous loophole for? you know, people to sneak out uh, and maneuver. Uh, thank you, Keprop. Uh, well, in engineering practice, uh, it all depends with the engineer. Because one, when one is already uh, qualified as an engineer to offer professional engineering services, uh, there are those ones who would uh, go to different uh, ventures. They will branch to, some go to engineering practice there's some who uh, you know, are employed. Um, there's some who go to di different sectors. So there are those ones who actually are practicing and they offer uh, the uh, different professional services. And you see, uh, as an engineer, uh, your main purpose is to solve problems. And as you s you're solving these problems, there is an aspect of design. Mm -hmm. You're designing, you carry out feasibility studies, then you come up with a solution, and that's why uh, um, Madam Pierce mentioned that there are so many, it is multi-dimensional in the sense that to arrive at a solution, you have to look at various options and these various options will require designs. When you design that particular project, there's a process of uh, implementation of the project, okay. uh, so a whole cycle of project management. All right. Now we have uh, until commissioning and even maintenance. So now we have engineers who would actually go into these particular projects and there are others who may you, they may choose a different path. So, for instance, if it is management uh, and so on, so they may not necessarily require the license to, uh, you know. Uh, but now when it comes to uh, offering professional engineering services, and uh, I think this one will speak it later, where the act and the rules have provided that uh, to have the engineering documents uh, valid, then they have to be actually uh, stamped uh, right. by a stamped I issued by the board, okay. and that is actually in the rules. Right. And and just to uh, 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 just to mention what uh, the CEO ma uh, said, uh, the cost of non-compliance. I think it is extremely important that uh, the public and the clients uh, uh, engage professional engineers. The reason why uh, you, to engage people who are not qualified, then it is going to be extremely costly to the economy. There is loss of property, loss of lives. Even the building we are in now, if it was constructed by, uh, for instance, someone who is not uh, qualified, uh, then we would even at a risk of uh, running this uh, program. All right. So it is very important for the sake of our country, for the sustainability of the economy, mm -hmm. and for posterity that we engage um, uh, engineers who are qualified engineers. Thank you. And you see, we, we cannot have... Uh, 
less qualified. Either an engineer is qualified or is not qualified. All right. And now the board has uh, created that framework uh, to, to ascertain. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. We have to take a break now, but please uh, ensure you uh, continue engaging us. We asked you a question, do you know how you can identify a professional engineer in Kenya? Keep tweeting us, hashtag new normal at NTV Kenya at Victor Kiprop. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to your world on NTV Kenya. We continue our discussion on the regulatory, uh, the engineering regulatory framework in Kenya, engineers in general and their contribution in the economy. Remember, we have with us Mrs. Nancy Karigiru, the PS uh, in the State Department of Maritime and Shipping. We have Nicholas Musuni, the CEO of the Engineers Board of Kenya. We have Grace Nyango with me here, Director of Capacity Building and Accreditation, and also Anthony Okere, Director of Compliance and Enforcement. And just before the break, we asked you to keep sending us your feedback. We had asked you, uh, do you know how to identify a professional engineer in Kenya? Let's see if we have some feedback. Uh, Jemo JC says, yes, I know how to identify one. That's good. Right, Isaac Marco Cheng says, yes, akikubali kuwacha at 45% and Akule 55%. All right, I don't know what he's alluding to. Arab Chepkin Dead, he says, watch the evening news. You want me a story on collapsed buildings and houses, bridges and potholes. Right, and then we have Felix Mogoi, he says, yes, I ask, this is Kenya for verification. And then uh, we have Dennis Osembo, he says, even welders are nowadays engineers. I think that's something we've touched on. Uh, do we still have some? We have Ali Bai, he says, what check will identify? How are you a professional engineer? <laughs> Interesting. Mustaleni says, how professional are you in Unuama Karatasi? Most of them have papers but can't do a thing. You give them jobs, they start becoming brokers. And then you realize they are even asking this Jokali from these questions on what is going on because themselves they don't know, they don't understand that thing. This is Kenya, my friend. And he continues to say that uh, that's why we are hiring the Chinese to do our jobs. You have to know, like this month, Nikona Jama Akona degree electronics na GNE. Heading paying 1K each afternoon confirms that yet Mimi new grade 2 uh, polytechnic. Jama ame get job, but anaongelelea. Anaongelea. Yeye ni simu tu mchana yote. Upuzi tu. And then uh, we have uh, underscore one boy, she says, um, I commend at Kenha Kenya for the project I wish they initialized dueling the roads for all the metropolitan areas, especially Machakos and Kajiado regions, the exact traffic pressure on Mombasa Road, improvement of Kangundo Road and its links with bypass to Wote Town through Masi, an expansion of the link road along Ngong Road to Isinya, as well as dueling of the Kitegela, Namanga Road and other river link roads could uh, be ingenious. Wambua continues to say the same bypass expansion should be implemented for Machakos town linking the city. This improves the level of service in the region. I think Wambua was responding, of course, to our initial question in the first part of our conversation. We'd like to continue. Uh, Grace, you've had some of the concerns raised there. And um, I think the challenge we have does not even come even after, just after graduation. It also comes even in school. Mm -hmm. And the other day we had, um, this worrying statistics where I think 12 universities in Kenya offer engineering courses mm -hmm. and as at then only six of them were actually accredited by the, by the board. Okay. How much of a concern? Um, uh, I think, I don't know where the statistics, statistics are from, we have I think more than 11 universities who yeah. are running accredited engineering programs in, yeah. uh, in Kenya. Yeah. Uh, but 
maybe I can just talk about the whole reason why accreditation is important. Yeah. Accreditation is a quality control mechanism to ensure that the learning outcomes, when you enter an engineering program, you must get the attributes that are required uh, by the time you are graduating. Uh, so that you, uh, like the, the comment uh, that uh, gentleman has said, Makaratasi uh, too, he doesn't know anything, and Amfunza etc. But you see, if, if uh, our universities offer quality engineering uh, education, uh, that would not be the case. So the board, together with the Commission of University Education, have come together because uh, they are responsible uh, for the academic end, we are responsible for the professional end, to make sure that engineering education in Kenya are giving the young people who are going through uh, these uh, programs the attributes that are required at the point where they graduate, so that when they get into industry, uh, it's more of being polished and being turned into uh, an engineer who knows the practical stuff. So, yes, we 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 um, we are very interested in ensuring that there is quality engineering education, and the universities in Kenya are always engaging with us. Uh, we have programs from marine engineering, uh, from the that um, the sector that PS is uh, uh, in charge of, uh, to the traditional civil, electrical, mechanical, mining mechatronics, uh, there are new frontiers, we are working on biomedical, we are working on uh, mining and mineral, metallurgical, so uh, the board um, is, is, is working hard to ensure that, number one, you get the quality foundation in terms of the engineering education that you get, and then you get the training that you need that will actually turn you into that uh, professional engineer so that you're able to address issues uh, uh, when you go to a site, wherever, whatever for you are in, you're able to address those specific issues. I think most of the comments have uh, were at the bearing of yes. skills gap. Yes. Let me bring in the PS, if, you, if, you, if she's still with us. PS, you heard about the, the, the viewer who spoke about people who have papers but mm. they can't deliver anything. Uh, it kind of brings the, 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 con the, the issue of skills gap. In the maritime sector that you have been for quite some time now, has this been a challenge where we have people who um, do not have perhaps the necessary qualifications or have some but cannot, you know, deliver the work, and we end up, you know, having to bring people from uh, other countries. Now, uh, le thank you for the question. Let me start by saying that uh, in the maritime sector, uh, because safety permeates every aspect of the operations that happen there, the, and, and also the fact that uh, the, the industry is international, there are no borders, or rather defined borders. We cannot afford, therefore, to have sector or silo mentality in terms of quality control, in terms of uh, qualifications, and therefore the area is regulated from the international forum. The International Maritime Organization, uh, which is the specialized agency of the United Nations, are uh, responsible for the safety of shipping, uh, sec maritime security, and the preservation of the marine environment has got very stringent conditions to ensure that the professionals are very well qualified and nobody slips through the cracks as it were. So highly unlikely that you'll find a quack in this area. How does it work? We are regulated or the area is regulated in terms of uh, uh, maritime education and training uh, through convention. We have conventions emanating from IMO and a sister organization known as uh, the, I mean, the ILO, you know, the International Labor Organization, which also has a very, very big role to play in terms of maritime labor. And the major convention in this area is known as the STCW, or in full, the International Convention on Standards of Training, Certification, and Watchkeeping for Seafarers. Competency is a very big word or a very big component of maritime training and education. And therefore, the, the, the idea is to interspace uh, theoretical training with hands-on uh, training as well. And the structures for training are very, very well laid out. And therefore, you know, when you see a marine engineer, when you see a naval architect, when you see a port engineer, uh, they are very, very highly qualified and very highly unlikely that they are they are going to be any people who skip I mean who slip through the, the cracks. 
Now, how it works is that while the IMO gives the convention and member states like Kenya, then are responsible for its implementation. But because of the implications on safety, particularly of the ship, the ship is being put in the hands of these professionals. The ship is far away on, I mean, on the waters. You don't have an automobile uh, association, AA, where you will wait and call. Therefore, the rules have developed in such a way that if at sea you have a problem as a, a master of a vessel, and then you call for help from somebody because, you know, your ship is in trouble, then something called salvage kicks in. And salvage means that another ship has come and helped you to a safe harbor or, you know, rescued that ship, uh, your ship from, from danger of sinking. And to enable or to make sure to encourage other people to invest in salvage, the, maritime, the International Maritime Organization came up with principles that have ensured that there are people at sea or other people who have invested in saving other vessels. Now, you don't want, or rather a ship owner will never want his ship to be salvaged. Right. So he will make sure that he has the best qualified and competent uh, personnel on board. Because if I save your ship as a salvo and bring it safely to shore, then I become automatically entitled to half the value of the vessel and to half the cargo, the value of the cargo on board. Nobody wants that. Right. So as you can see, we have no room at all for quacks in, in, in this profession. Thank you, P.S. And maybe to bring back Nicholas, at one point in this country, we actually had, a, I think, a shortage of engineers, if I'm not wrong. Uh, maybe bring us up to speed on where we are today. Do we actually have enough engineers and are they being utilized? Uh, is the expertise being utilized as it should be? Um, to answer that question, uh, uh, Mr. Kiprop, I would want to point out that uh, in terms of engineering education, we are doing quite well, I would say. Um, a few years back, we probably had uh, uh, two universities. Uh, initially, we had the uh, University of uh, Nairobi, and we had uh, Moi University. Uh, later on, we had uh, Jomo Kenyatta University. But now, uh, we have uh, 12 universities uh, that we have worked together uh, to uh, streamline their programs to ensure that uh, the quality that the industry requires is ingrained in the program itself. And so, uh, whereas uh, we were having maybe 500 graduates uh, per annum um, seven or so years ago, we are now closing in on 2,000 graduates and counting. Uh, there are a number of additional programs that are also coming in. And so, uh, we are doing well in terms of uh, uh, the number of uh, graduates that are coming through. What we are now faced with is a scenario where we have quite a number of uh, good graduate engineers coming into the industry, but now transitioning them into, into professional engineers. And that is where we have a challenge with the professional engineers because there is a process towards that uh, in terms of giving them the necessary um, uh, exposures, giving them the necessary opportunities and mentorship to ensure that they grow within their careers. Uh, this is the, now the issue we are addressing at the board uh, through uh, various interventions. One of them, we have uh, engaged government to establish a graduate engineer's internship program so that a graduate uh, of uh, an engineering program, uh, having been invested on uh, so much uh, in terms of their engineering education, is granted an opportunity to work in these projects in the industry uh, both private and uh, public sectors, and uh, under the mentorship of professional engineers right. uh, to have the sufficient skills. So we are looking at a situation whereby um, the country uh, at the moment, if you look at uh, a per capita ratio of uh, one engineer to 5,000 uh, people, we would be talking about pro probably approximately 9,000 to 10,000 professional engineers. We have over... 17,000 graduate engineers, and therefore the task ahead of us is converting those graduate engineers um, to reach uh, that required ratio. 
Okay. Uh, at the moment, we are closing in on 3,000 professional engineers and uh, um, compared to 1,300 that we had uh, seven years ago. Okay. Uh, so we have doubled the number of uh, professional engineers uh, over the last seven years under the new framework. And we are looking now through the graduate engineers internship program, provide opportunities for all graduate uh, or, or engineers um, into the practice under proper mentorship, under proper guidance for them to get all the necessary skills and then we can deal with uh, their deficiencies. All right. And maybe to grace on that point about the training um, and the guidance that engineers need to be able to transition to become professionals, then for any graduate engineer watching today, what is the importance of going through this phase in terms of improving your chances, of course, of landing a, a, um, a job or, or, or any absorption? Um, it is that program, uh, what we have built into that program is training uh, that is geared towards making you a professional engineer and not just for the Kenyan market but for the international market because it's uh, benchmarked with the uh, standards from the, uh, again, one of the global bodies that we want to accede to the International Engineering Alliance. So that uh, when you go through that structured training, you're able to gain the uh, professional competencies required, which are broad, um, not only the technical skills that are required for you to practice as an engineer, but also the soft skills that are required of uh, an engineer, project management skills, uh, um, engineering problem solving, how do you manage engineering activities. So uh, our aim um, is that the process and the, the reason why we have such huge numbers, the framework that we have now has shortened that transition period from uh, um, uh, for transiting from a graduate engineer to a professional engineer. Okay. Before that, it would take something like 10 years. But if you go through uh, any model that we run under the Graduate Engineers Internship Program, we're trying to shorten that to about three to four years so that we are able to churn out and get uh, competent professional engineers from the graduate engineers that we have. What does this mean for this country? It means that uh, we'll be able to realize our development agendas much faster. It means uh, that uh, perhaps we can give local engineers the opportunity uh, to be able to run uh, these international projects that, uh, that we're seeing being run by um, um, people from different countries. It means that, uh, and especially for women engineers, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a woman engineer, I'm sorry for sneaking that yeah. in, but it, it means we, we have, uh, and especially from the woman engineer front, we have more role models for the young ladies who want to be women engineers but are so intimidated because it's a male-dominated uh, sector. Uh, it means that uh Kenya will be able to compete you know, on the global arena uh, in every single area of uh, engineering. And it's not the traditional engineering. There are new frontiers in engineering. Okay. You've had PS talking about marine engineering and the blue economy. Uh, so uh, it means that Kenya will be uh, a, a force to reckon with when it comes to matters engineering and offering professional engineering services, okay. regardless of whichever discipline. Yes. Thank you. I actually like the point about women engineers and, yes. and the fact that it's dominated by by, by, the, by the male gender, yes. because um, if the PS is still with us, she, she'll tell you that even the, the maritime sector yes. has yes. suffers from the same. Yes. PS, in your closing remarks then, uh, with regards to what Grace has mentioned, how do we actually get more, engin more female engineers, and not just more female engineers, but also more female engineers in the maritime sector? And how much of importance does this mean to um, us as a country? Oh, thank you for the question. Uh, you will realize that globally, uh, women in the maritime sector are few and far between, uh, particularly at uh, management uh, position in the technical areas. If you go to shipping, for example, uh, only 2% of the one, approximately 1.2% 1 of seafarers are female. And even those 2% work in the, a uh, majority of them work in the hospitality industry. You're talking of cruise shipping. Therefore, there has been a deliberate move uh, by the United Nations, uh, particularly working through the International Maritime Organization, to attract more females in the, in the maritime sector in these areas, a very deliberate uh, move. And one of the targets or, or one of the, uh, the ways that it has been done or it's being done is to provide role models particularly to the young girls, 
so that they see the industry as a job, uh, you know, for job availability. Also, uh, bringing women together so that they can be mentors. Oh. Uh, the, the women, like uh, in my position, to mentor the young girls uh, to see this as, a, as an area where they, they, they can get jobs, availing uh, opportunities for training, being deliberate uh, about okay. that. All right. And we are trying very hard. We've got we've brought women together, uh, particularly in Africa, into women's associations, so that we can then bring and hold activities that particularly target and you know make women visible All right. uh, to students. Thank you. Uh, Thank to you. Be able to see their Thank, Thank you, you, Honorable PS. And and to Anthony, in your closing remarks in just thirty seconds, I am I have a project. Any any type of project that needs an engineer, and I need to get one. How do I know that they are a professional engineer? Do I, have, do I ask them to show me their certificates? What do I do? Uh, uh, thank you, Kiprop. So, um, no, you don't necessarily, of course, you can confirm the certificates and uh, the, the license because it's very, very important. Uh, but the board has given a framework uh, which is through the engineer's rules. And the way one, these are the four ways you'll identify an engineer. One, uh, you can ask the engineer to uh, show you the, his or her identity card. Um, I carried mine. This, we, we have a partnership with the National Bank of Kenya where we have the production of the engineer's identity card. Okay. So okay. the uh, card has a code that you can uh, send to the board and confirm. Right. It has the name of the engineer, it has the number of the engineer, so that you're able to confirm whether this uh, person is uh, registered and licensed with the board or not. So All it's right. very important for the public to... To, to, to ask uh, the engineer to produce his or her ID so okay. that we have the, uh, to avoid confusion. There's a commentator who, I mean, there's a, a viewer who said that even these days welders are called engineers. You see, even when you go to Matatu, sometimes you can, you can tell uh, the driver, you call him pilot, pilot, let's go here. Uh, okay. The pilot would not deny, right. but, uh, you know, the, the, the issue is uh, how to identify one. So that is one. Secondly, the use of engineer stamps. That is extremely important because in engineering, there is a language that we use, and this language is the engineering drawing. A drawing that is designed here by a Kenyan engineer can be interpreted by uh, a, a, you know, a, an engineer from America, an engineer from Singapore, an engineer from another country. Oh, yeah. So the, these particular documents must be certified a stamp that is issued by the board. So we'd like to, our clients, the public, members of the public, if you want to know an engineer and the board is in the process of issuing these stamps and we're encouraging our engineers to apply for, to get the stamps. So look at a document, engineering document. Okay. I'm talking about uh, we surveys, have to up, Anthony. Yeah. feasibility study, yeah, just, just as I wind up, yeah. feasibility studies, uh, all types of engineering drawings. Make sure they are stamped by an engineer. Uh, you know, the name of the engineer is there, the number of the engineer, the signature of the engineer. There are two things. One, he owns the drawing, okay. and then we'll be able to put the engineer, uh, you know, to account right. the event that uh, uh, he or she does not uh, accept the drawings. And then, so, so it will actually serve the public, and the public is able to know and to use the uh, co correct uh, uh, drawings. And then two, two more, there is a site instruction booklet, and uh, this one is able to, you know, to, to get... Uh, and, and, then, and also uh, the project stickers. Right. So in a nutshell, uh, uh, we would like to uh, add the members of the public, kindly lie us with the board. If you have any queries, if you have any issues, like there's a, someone from, from America is, is actually uh, been calling for the last few weeks. He, she involved an, uh, someone called an engineer, and this person is not actually qualified. Okay. And the building that was... We in, have to in, go. He was involved in, uh, you know, it, it ends up collapsing. So we have uh, to go, Anthony. The engineer's identity card and the engineer stamps. Uh, All thank right. You. Thank you very much, Anthony. Very comprehensive. I hope we have taken note of those four ways of identifying um, a professional engineer. And finally, to Nicholas, this celebration, the World Engineers Day, is coming up next week. Uh, as you wind up very briefly, please tell us uh, what you can expect and what it means for engineers in Kenya. Uh, thank you. Um, the, we are working very closely with the, our institution, uh, that is the Society for Engineers, Institution of Engineers of Kenya, uh, to have the World Engineering Day on for the um, March 2021. Uh, we will be, as I said earlier, uh, having a function at the University of Nairobi. Uh, we will be uh, giving further details. I think some of the programs we are looking at, for instance, we are going to also be launching our uh, unveiling our new uh, interactive website and very many other exciting things that we will also be sharing with the public. 
And uh, as I conclude, I would want to point out that uh, engineering as a profession and indeed any other profession, uh, our essence is in the constitution. If you look at your constitution, Article 46.1c, it guarantees members of the public that they should have mechanisms to have products, services that are safe, that are healthy, and that uh, fit their economic interest. If you look at that concept, then uh, we are there to safeguard the public, to promote public health, and also for those who are investing, to ensure that your economic interests are taken care of. All Thank right. you very much. All right, Grace, in your closing remarks in just 20 seconds, I'm a university student. I'm starting to worry if this is the right choice. Should I drop out and pursue something else? Should I? No, you shouldn't, because uh, the, the board has got a very strong mentorship framework uh, together with the society, and we, uh, we, uh, we have, through this, uh, the institution, a student uh, chapter. So you shouldn't drop out. The future is bright. There are opportunities uh, for young engineers, and uh, they, we will work with them and make sure that they become professional engineers and realize their dreams. All right. Yes. Thank you very much, Chris. I think it's been, been a very, very, very uh, insightful discussion. Uh, and a lot of thanks to my panelists, uh, Mrs. Nancy Karigiri, the Principal Secretary of the State Department of Maritime and Shipping Affairs, Nicholas Musuni, the CEO of the Engineers Board of Kenya, Anthony Okere, the Director of Compliance and Enforcement at EBK, and finally, Grace Onyango, the Director of Capacity Building and Accreditation at EBK. Just before we go, we promise that we'll sample the last uh, feedback from uh, our viewers. Remember, we had asked you if you know how to identify a professional engineer in Kenya. And Boaz Amukoye says, I think the comments of the gentleman who tweeted about an engineer repairing electronics are misplaced. Engineering is more about design, not a matter of tunafanyanga hizi. I think most of the panelists would agree. Junior Mans says, are you trying to say that those rich people who will afford it are the ones who drive the economy thinking face and the music face? It it's doesn't make sense since uh, very few people can afford to use uh, com commercial users uh, in brackets, matatu, cabs and trackers, just a few. I think he was referring to the expressway. And then we have Kimani Karaoke says no. Also, anyone who thinks the expressway will solve traffic is either a beneficiary of chronism or doesn't understand the modern uh, traffic, urban traffic management. The expressway is, way, uh, is a cash cow for few cabals and shall be regretted by Kenyans years to come. And then we have at, at Am Jose, he says, I, I am never ready to pay my rent. What about an expressway? Jacob Brewer says, yes, I am. It's a game changer. Time saved in travel is worth the charge. I think uh, the last three comments were also in reference to the expressway. And then uh, Goodman Erickson says, using our taxes to build it, then taxing us to use it. How? Very critical question, I should say. And then at Huyu, he says, why should we pay and it's a loan we are paying uh, back as taxpayers? I'm not sure that will work. Do we still have some more? Yes, a Congo or Congo. Those that determine the standards, do they know everything? I think this is in reference to how you can identify engineers in Kenya, uh, professional engineers. And the last one, Rwanda Magere, he says, this is a permanent solution if you count money and time lost for those years is even more. Furthermore, it's upgrading and rating, up, uh, rating our city up. And I think that last comment was in reference to the Nairobi Expressway. Ladies and gentlemen, I have really enjoyed this discussion and uh, very much thanks to both of you. I think I've really recognized you. And we have come to the end of show, the, the show. Thank you for keeping us company through the two and uh, two hours now. And uh, of course, we'll see you next Monday. Have been your host, Victor Kitwapa. Keep watching.